On the morning of Wednesday the 6th of April 1966, students and a teacher from Westall High School near Melbourne in Australia reported seeing a UFO. The object flew over the school, then reappeared some 20 minutes later being pursued by five unidentified aircraft. The teacher and students maintain their story to this day, but could it have been something mundane like a weather balloon, as sceptics insist? And if so, why was the school flooded with military personnel telling everyone that they hadn't seen anything? Join myself and Neil here on Aliens Explored as we look into the differing theories surrounding this compelling case. Aliens Explored is a weekly podcast exploring famous and obscure cases of UFO sightings, alien abductions and other strange events from both a believing and a sceptical perspective whilst keeping an open mind. I'm Stu Jackson, a professional actor and amateur ufologist with a particular interest in the crop circle phenomenon. I'll be debating that otherworldly visitations are real. The truth is out there. And I'm Neil Kelly. I'm a professional actor as well and used to work for the military as an intelligence analyst. I'll be arguing from a more doubtful point of view. I mean, it's all a bit far-fetched, isn't it? Hello, listeners. Hello, viewers. Welcome to another episode of Aliens Explored, your weekly look at the mysterious skies, outer space, bottoms of the ocean, crop circles, uh, people in smoke for rooms plotting and conspiring. Um, I'm one of your hosts, Neil Kelly. And I'm your other conspiracist, Stu Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing, going, Stu? Neil? I'm I'm <laughs> good. Doing, I'm doing good, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. This is so so for our, our listeners and viewers, well into the new year now. Uh, approaching february but this is our last episode that we're recording before we take our break for uh for our season well, before work. we go off and do other stuff before we go and do seasonal yeah. work yeah yeah so yeah it's uh <clears throat> yeah it's going to be an interesting time going to be a busy time it's going to be a busy time. It always is. I wish it wasn't. I'm looking forward to when it isn't. I'm just sort of the most busiest up. time of the year. <laughs> it used to be a very slack time for me. My my work used to dry up round about mid November and not pick up again till the end of January. So it was a really, yeah, I had plenty of leisure time, but also plenty of financial worries because I had nothing much coming in. Yeah, yeah I, I find while, but... January to April is usually a bit of a quiet time. Okay. Yeah, mm. Mm. No, I'll be straight back into it. I'll be, yes, well, especially with you, Mister Monopoly. Especially with Mister Monopoly, yeah, it's basically a full time job, isn't it? So, yes, and that's why you're you're giving introductions to Mister Monopoly on Aliens Explored. <laughs> it, it's yeah, it's it's um, it's uh, it's a hard habit to break. I do it several <laughs> times a day. <laughs> Your, your mind does just get into into a sort of pattern. I, I was doing when, during the COVID lockdown. We, we were doing COVID testing at my wife's school. I was hired as one of the testers, and of course, every person who came in, especially after they came back to school, the government decided to send all the kids back, and they all came in one after the other, and they all had these forms, and I had to record the last four digits of their serial number before they went for their test. So all day long, I was writing down these four-digit sequences, 4372, 1264-5599, all that, whatever. Then after work, I thought, oh, I need to put some some petrol gas in the car. Went to the petrol station, um, filled up, and... It was just slightly over the mount by a, a pound or two that you can use contact contactless right. for. So I had to type them up in. Couldn't remember it. I've been doing all these different. 
doing all these stitches all day. And and it got I, I in the end I had to phone my wife to come and come and rescue me. <laughs> it's, it's forgotten my pin. Yeah, you're learning too much stuff and it pushes mm. other stuff. And I'm I'm reminded of the Homer Simpson one where he uh he he learnt how to make his own wine and forgot how to drive. <laughs> <laughs> one bit of knowledge pushed out the other bit and yeah that that must be it that must be it <laughs> yes but well, speaking of of knowledge replacing knowledge we're gonna we're going back to school this week aren't we yes we and we're going back in indeed. time oh, I like going, that. going back that's a good one <laughs> <laughs> going back uh more than 50 years um yeah. to a ufo sighting in australia 6th of April, 1966, on the outskirts of, of Melbourne. Mm. Yeah, a place called Clayton. A place called Clayton. Yeah. Westall um, High School. Which is now Westall Secondary College, um, where students and a teacher reported seeing um, a flying object described as grey or, or silvery green, a saucer-shaped craft, with a slight purple hue and about twice the size of a family car, um, yes. as far as they could tell, I guess. Yeah. So um, they said the object was descending. It overflew the high school, disappeared behind a stand of trees, um, and then approximately 20 minutes later, <laughs> by which time I think one, of the, one, one or more of children had run indoors and fetched a teacher, the object object reportedly reappeared um climbed at speed and departed towards the northwest um and yeah. some accounts said it's being pursued by five unidentified aircraft small aircraft in particular oh are we talking small aircraft as in like light aircraft or are we talking I, that that's my understanding of it um but no specific um no specific details have been given. I mean, a helicopter is a small aircraft, but people are a bit normally a bit more specific, aren't they? When they they will say helicopter. Oh, but... these were <laughs> specifically aeroplanes. Um, mm. So I'm I'm guessing, yeah, we're talking light light aircraft rather than yeah, yeah. However, a check later showed that no commercial, private, or Royal Australian Air Force pilots had reported anything unusual in the area. Well, that's um, that's a bit ambiguous, isn't it? Because what they what the children seen might have been something that a pilot was expecting to see. In which case, it wasn't. Um, it, it wasn't. It is unusual. But what I find so so this obviously you've got all the the, the kids have seen this thing. You've got the teacher Andrew Greenwood, uh, mm. his name is, um, who who have seen this thing. That in itself makes this quite a unique and compelling account. But what makes it really interesting for me is 40 minutes later mm -hmm. after this has happened. So this is an hour after it's they've first seen this thing. Military flood the school. Mm. Military personnel. And tell everyone to didn't see anything really. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what do we make of that? Um, well, one explanation, the usual explanation was that it was a weather balloon. Um do military follow uh, weather balloons around telling everyone they didn't see anything when they've seen a weather balloon? Uh well, there was a suggestion that um that balloons were were up monitoring. Was it nuclear tests? Was there a was there a nuclear test? I mean, if near if a were, school, they, they would have noticed them. You know, <laughs> a huge mushroom cloud in the distance as well. So, if it had drifted away from observing a nuclear test, it's probably blown a an awful long way. Um, I mean, there's some large Keith... areas of wilderness in Australia. You know, the outback. But not around Mel Melbourne's quite a densely populated, like Victoria, 
Um, do they do nuclear Lebanese. tests in Australia? I mean, it is a huge landmass. I mean, you could do a nuclear test and probably not affect many people. I've, I've not heard of it happening, but that doesn't rule this out, of course. Um, um, someone called yeah. Keith Basterfield. Um, who's Keith Basterfield? Just check who he is. Um doesn't say who he is. I'm looking at... Uh, but he suggested it was a runaway balloon from the Highball, which is short for High Altitude Balloon Project, used to monitor radiation levels after British nuclear tests at Maralinga. Where's Maralinga? Um, which is in sort of central... On the south coast, about, about the middle of Australia, quite a long way to the northwest of... Um, of, the, of of where the sighting happened, an awful long okay, way. So, so, so let's explore that as a as a possibility that this this mm. surveillance balloon, what what mm. we would term a weather balloon, although they use mm. multiple things, uh, yeah. whether um, whether pattern detection is just one of them, but but let's call it a weather balloon for for mm. want of a. This has floated away and floated over the school and these kids and this teacher have seen it and report it. Now, for a military spokesperson to then come on the TV, come on, you know, to report to media and say, yeah, yeah, all it was is this weather balloon, it got away, it blew off its pre-programmed flight mm -hmm. pattern or whatever, that's what the kids saw. Yeah, I can... Mm. I can accept that as a response, mm. but for military personnel to come onto the school, and, and we're not talking a small number here, we're talking mm. like basically a platoon descended on the school and you didn't see anything. Why would they do that if that's all it was? Um, yeah, I don't know why you would flood the school with military personnel. Um, if if something like a balloon, I mean, one one suggestion was a weather balloon. One suggestion was that it was a towed target, mm -hmm. um, something that's towed behind a plane for other planes to shoot at. And you would imagine it would be on a very very long tow line. You know, I'd want it to be at least yeah. half a mile long if I was towing a target um, for, that people were going to shoot at. Um, yeah, and, and for some reason it had gone off course and had flown over a populated area and flown over a school, then, um, yeah, you would expect a spokesperson to turn up at the school and say, it was nothing to worry about. Um, yeah. Don't worry. Um, but the teacher was actually threatened, wasn't he? he was, um... Yes, he was. I'm glad you've raised this uh, because that I find particularly damning. They they hmm. threatened his job. Uh yeah, they said, well, you were obviously drunk. Obviously well, they, you've been drinking. They, That's why they saw this. They thing. said to him that if he maintains his story, if he keeps talking hmm. about it, that's what they will say. We will have to say you were drunk on the job. Hmm. I, yeah, um, if it's something innocuous, if it's something, hmm. you know, quite rational, easily explained, why would they do hmm. that? A skeptic called Brian Dunning. Oh, yeah. is he? Is he someone we've we've um we American writer Brian and Dunning producer before. who focuses on science and skepticism, hosts the weekly podcast Skeptoid since two thousand and six. Um, he's suggesting two things. He's saying that a weather balloon is a likely explanation for the first half of the event, um, but a nylon target drogue like a like a windsock towed by one plane for others to chase down and known to be in use to the local Royal Australian Air Force at the time, was at least one very reasonable possibility for the second half. So they they saw two things. Um, and he said that as the years have passed, descriptions of what was actually seen have now become diluted with made-up descriptions by an unknown number of students who didn't see anything. And there's no way to know which is which. Now, we've had this before, haven't we, that, that school in Zimbabwe, where yeah. um, a number of students saw what looked like a, a UFO coming down near to the school in, in out, yeah. out in the brush somewhere. But a number of students who were there who said, well, they never saw anything. 
or were they there? Uh, you know, it, it all become. I mean, when you talk dealing with children, um, accounts can become very vague, can't they? Because there will be kids who weren't there who claim they saw it, mm-hmm. and kids who were there who said they saw nothing. Worth bearing or, in mind with that specific case. So I've I've forgotten the guy's mm-hmm. name, but there's one particular guy who was a student at the time there, uh, mm-hmm. who is very very vocal in saying. No, nobody saw anything. It was kind of, you know, just one person saying it to another and then, you know, mm. it spread from there. Five years, and that's what he does to this day. He's he's very, very adamant about that. Um, five years ago, he was on record saying it definitely, definitely happened and I was there and I saw it. Mm. So, so we've got unreliable witnesses, basically. Yeah, yeah. And this is this um, is one of the problems with witness testimony. Full stop. Is mm. you know the 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 mind's capability to fill in details, uh, particularly mm. when it's an unknown thing, is is a recognised phenomenon. So, yeah, it it does make witness testimony challenging uh, mm. at times. Um, it's not. It doesn't seem to be clear what the teacher actually saw because it looks like the thing overthrew the school which made kids or at least one kid run inside and get the teacher. So the teacher came yeah. out and saw something. Don't know how much of it he actually saw. It it looks like Westall High is in, in a fairly, I mean, it's not out in the brush. It, it's, it's in an urban or at least suburban area of Melbourne. Well, Victoria, have you ever been to Australia yourself? Yeah, but I haven't been to Melbourne. Right, okay. I I got uh, relatives who live uh, in Victoria, mm. so not in Melbourne itself, but um, mm. in the, the Dandenong Ranges, and uh, yeah, it is quite a sort of rural, spread out area. Mm. Um, but that said, you can't go more than a couple of miles without you know finding another town, sort of thing. Um, but but yeah, space is there, there's plenty of space in Australia. Uh, yeah, but this to... this looks like it, it's an area that's coloured in quite densely. That looks like Melbourne, and it's showing this, you know, the the um, the location of Westall High within Melbourne. So I'm imagining it's fairly densely populated area. It's near that. It's not far from the bay by the looks of it. Mm-hmm. So well, that's it. And the, and the further east you go in Australia, the more um, the more densely populated it is well yeah most of the population live on the east coast don't they yeah so yeah most of the big cities are there but also if you wonder why that wouldn't have been seen by an awful lot of other people away from the school unless that that area really is a lot less densely populated than it looks like on this map it's it's possible i mean obviously without knowing the map you're looking at um yeah mm. it, it's quite possible it wasn't that densely pop also how many people just sort of walk around looking upwards all the time? Um, yeah, how many times have we, I don't know, I'd say we, we as a much more general than you and I, but uh, but how many times have people sort of seen an object flying across the sky, not thought anything of it, just automatically thought, oh, it must be a plane. Yeah. And just dismissed it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm of the strong belief that there are far more UFOs, UAPs active in our skies than get reported. Mm. Much more. Um, And, you know, people, don't forget, in the 1960s as well, people were being massively ridiculed uh, for saying they'd seen a UFO. There was a huge active campaign going on globally at the time um, that was really ridiculing people very, very strongly Mm. for reporting UFOs. So, yeah, I I wouldn't, you say, you know, it's surprising a lot of other people didn't see it. I wouldn't rule out that they didn't. (laughs) Maybe they did, they just didn't come forward. Something the size of two cars coming down near a school disappeared behind a stand of trees yeah so um, that to me just means it went overhead and they lost sight of it behind the trees 
So if it, it if it was a balloon and it it climbed, said said for some reason it it came down as balloons sometimes do and then go up again as balloons sometimes do. It must have been coming from the southeast, and presumably it was travelling with the wind if it was a balloon. Yeah, one of the what... things that has always mystified me is mm. hot air balloons. Right. How do they pilot hot air balloons? And and I know it happens. I know they they'll take off from one place and they'll land like in a pre-designated place. How can they do that? Um, it's, <laughs> it's any means of propulsion. It, it's by convection. So at a certain altitude, that um, actually air flows go in a kind of circle. So right. depending on what altitude you're at, so if you're if you're heading east, you're being carried by the wind east, at a, and you're flying at a certain altitude. Um, in order to pick up an air current that's going west, you just simply go up until you hit that westward right. air current. Go okay. back to the way you came. Okay. So yeah, I, yeah, I can. Right. Thank you. I have to or go down, whatever, whatever you know. But um, but basically, um, air is air is circulating. It's not all just blowing in one. Right. Okay. Um, and I'm guessing it's not that neat either. So if you wanted to go north, then you would just go to the right mm. height. And, and also, in a, in a hot air balloon, you would not be travelling in any kind of windy conditions. You're, you're talking about very mild air currents, yeah. and really, really mild. I, I was in Australia. I was up north in Cairns and there was a, a woman in my hostel who shared a room with and um, I stayed there for a while, maybe a week or so. But every morning I'd hear her getting up at about 5 a.m. to go and do this balloon flight. She had her heart set on. And then a few hours later, I'd get up and she'd come back and say, no, I couldn't do it today. Too much, yeah. too much wind. And and it's even doing a parachute jump. You know, I was doing parachute training in the army. Um, it's different from military parachutists, but we were doing civilian parachute jumps and they you couldn't jump in a wind that's higher than than 10 knots and we'd be stood on the ground thinking well it's really calm and they'd be saying no but up at up at three thousand feet where you'll be jumping um it's more than 10 knots so you can't jump yes yeah well i've seen that with the drone yeah at ground level. yeah you got yeah you get it up to a certain level and yeah yeah 200 foot it's yeah uh or 100 foot even yeah. Okay. Um, but I didn't get the the view. So the way it's described, this this UAP came overhead. Where it says it disappeared below the tree line, I I'm not mm. getting the impression that it came down. It just mm. sort of carried along. Of if it was quite low level to start with, it would just have to carry on in a straight line, and it would disappear behind the trees. Um, yeah, you'd lose sight of it because the trees are in the way. Yeah. That, but that's then, kind and, of how I'm interpreting that. Yeah, and then maybe once it's travelled a bit further, you can see it again. Yeah, or maybe it did a U-turn. Or yeah. Maybe, yeah. Mm. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure it, it came down onto the ground. Hmm. There is I a mean, bit more to this story because it didn't end there. Um so as well as the military <laughs> turning up, threatening this teacher, poor Andrew Greenwood, mm. um, it didn't silence him. He kept on talking publicly about it, and he ended up getting a visit from some people in suits who... Were they black were... suits by any chance? They were dark-coloured suits, and yeah, yeah. Uh, they claimed to be from the government. Uh, and mm. they also warned him not to speak of it. And very much, yeah, the very you've hit the nail on the head. Sounds very much like a men in black. Or encounter. possibly people from the school board say yeah, people from the, the Department of Education <laughs> say, Listen, you better stop this or uh, Well apparently to... the reason they gave him for why he needed to stop talking was because it was a secret government exercise, they said. Okay. Now, what's the secret government uh, exercise doing above a bloody school? <laughs> yeah, but if it was a secret government exercise that had gone, a, gone, a, gone astray, 
that a, a high ball that had been sent up to monitor radiation broke free of its tether, for instance. Or have you ever done that with a kite? Do you ever do that with a kid and you, you've got a kite and you're flying it and you're, you're letting the string out and you let the string out and the kite falls and then you pull it taut and it goes up again and you keep doing that and then you get to the end of the spool and you realise that the, the, the string isn't tied to the <laughs> to the spool. <laughs> it just flies up and you just watch your kite going off. You know, you've got it up to its maximum height and then effectively let it go. <laughs> I've done that say one. I've ever done that. Um, yeah, so but that sounds like fun. Yeah, I've um, done that. It was a long walk to go and get my kite. Actually, that that happened to me. Um, and I went with my dad to get a kite, and I remember he had to climb over a hedge. Um, and then there was a ditch on the other side, and he had to. Sort of, he ended up in the ditch. Um, but he also found another kite, so I <laughs> came over <home> too. <laughs> and the one that my, the, the kite that I lost was just a plain yellow kite. But the one that came out was a black one with a skull and crossbones on it that was actually a really good flyer as well. So, yeah, <laughs> I consider Makes myself. Me wonder how many um, how, how many UFOs are reported that are just untethered kites that have <laughs> blown away? Well, the, I, I remember when I was a kid, there was, there was a kite that was, um, it was a silver thing and it had a, some sort of spinning thing in, inside it that right. you know, was spinning the wind. And it was called the UFO. I mean, it wasn't very big. <laughs> But it, you will be, will be putting this sort of yeah. silvery, glistening thing, catching the sunlight up into the sky. So, <laughs> well, okay. So, so, so back onto the point with it. If it was indeed a secret military experiment, hmm. this is a country that famously has huge, massive tracts of land where there is nobody. Hmm. Why would you do this anywhere near? Why would you do it in hundreds of miles of a populated area? Well, as as we saw with the the recent um, Chinese spy balloon over the United States, that um, balloons go a long way once once they're cut adrift, they they never stop. Well, it's claimed it's a Chinese spy balloon. That's a whole other thing <laughs> completely. Yeah. Um, yeah, because that's the UFO community is still mm. questioning that one. Um, so we've come to that point with these things. Um, I'll ask the question as I as I often do. Andrew Greenwood, these students, do mm. you believe them? Um, yeah, I do. I believe that they saw something that they couldn't explain. They couldn't explain it as something being towed by an aircraft um it's it's this thing was supposedly flew away being trailed by air being chased by aircraft mm -hmm. um although they think that the authorities seem to deny that they had any aircraft seeing anything unusual i mean maybe if you know if you're a, a, a fighter pilot and you've been sent up to to shoot down this runaway balloon or to you know or it's chase this target um and then when you came say yeah there was a towed target and you were sent up to shoot at it when you came down again and someone said did you see anything unusual in the sky I said, well no no i didn't see anything i didn't expect to see i just saw this target that i was sent up to shoot um i don't know i i, I do believe that they believe they saw something um of course, sat here in my chair in South London, all I can do is speculate and say, well, yeah. maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But ultimately, I can't say to them, no, you didn't see this. What you saw was something else, because, you know, who, who am I to say that? So I, I, I think we're, we're very much on the same page with this. Um, I absolutely, I, I agree with you. I think Andrew Greenwood definitely believes he saw something. Um, mm. And you, you, when when you watch him in interviews and and things, you know, some people just have an air of credibility about them. Mm. You know, you, you instinctively sort of get that, and and I very much get that from him. But also the the behaviour of the military straight after this event, I yeah. find highly suspicious. Mm. Why would they, yeah? To to flood the school, the rest of it is kind of there's there's hearsay about these you know the men in black thing, 
that's hearsay. Um, the threats about him being drunk on the job is also hearsay. But the military turning up at the school and flooding it like they did, yeah, that's not you know, and that is really bizarre behaviour, uh, especially mm. if it's something innocuous or, I mean, especially if it's a secret military experiment. Hmm. That. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. Know. I, I can certainly imagine that any sort any any teacher who's telling tales about something supernatural or paranormal or extraterrestrial, um, is going to be told to stop it. Yeah, you know, we don't. We don't. Whether you saw it or not, um, mm. you're upsetting people. You're frightening people. Yeah, it's not your yeah. job. And, and bringing disrepute as well to the school, especially back yeah. in the sixties, uh, you were considered a nutter if you reported anything yeah. like that so yeah well there we go but i really want to hear what our listeners and viewers think uh about this particular case the westall 1966 ufo um did we say what date it happened what date um, yeah it, i mean it was the 6th of april but i couldn't remember if we'd said at 11 a.m so 11 a.m on wednesday the 6th of april 1966 yeah yeah so so is Presumably that within nice that's within the window for have had visibility it wasn't dark you know it wasn't um, night time or anything like that that would be autumn in australia wouldn't it um yeah but 11 a.m it's going to be daylight yeah yeah it's going to be daylight yeah yeah so uh so yeah so i yeah Listeners, viewers, let us know what you think about this case. You can contact us via the usual means, of course. You can email us, aliensexplored at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, you can put a comment below uh, our YouTube video. Um, and if you're one of our Patreon subscribers, then you get exclusive access to our Discord server as well. So that's worth thinking about. And you'll be supporting the channel as well, which we'd very much appreciate. Join us next time when we'll be looking into the life and times of UFO researcher Stanton Friedman. Looking forward to that one. Yeah, me too. Wasn't he the first, wasn't he the guy who investigated Roswell? We'll be discussing that amongst that, other that's, things. Oh, that's Stanton time. Friedman. Right? <laughs> yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah, so don't miss that. In the meantime... Keep watching the skies and keep watching the skies. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Watch, <laughs> watch, watch, watch the skies. Take care for now. Bye-bye. Catch you next time. Bye-bye. Aliens Explored is a Fecal Films production in association with Juicy Falls. Music by Darren Mafucci and editing by Stu Jackson. Find us on Twitter or Facebook by searching Aliens Explored or visit us on aliensexplored.com.